Well, preaching on Membership Sunday really means that I guess I'm just going to talk to, uh, to Kevin and Melissa this morning, and the rest of you can just go home. There's nothing, nothing for you to listen to here. As, as the choir, as the, the choir usually leaves anyways. They're not taking me literally. I'm reminded of, there's a, there's a passage from St. Paul in Romans um, where Paul says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about this morning. As Unitarian Universalists, one of the shared expressions of our religious tradition is the seven principles. Um, and so if you, if you are, are new here and aren't sure what the seven principles are, uh, they can actually be found among the contents at the beginning of the hymnal. If you go to the first hymn and then turn back one page, uh, there, the seven principles are kind of, are kind of in, that, in that section. Um, if you have been coming here a long time and don't have them memorized, they're there as well. That got a laugh at the first service. At first glance... The seven principles seem fairly straightforward. They're acceptable. They make sense. There's nothing controversial or radical about them. They're as non-offensive as the golden rule. It would be hard to imagine anybody objecting to them. However, I'm convinced, I'm convinced that a close reading of the seven principles reveals that a couple of them, maybe even most of them, contain a challenging tension that is a struggle to resolve. Take the fifth principle, for instance. That principle affirms the use of the democratic process in our congregations and in society at large, and also affirms the right of conscience. That seems fairly innocuous. Both those things, democracy and and conscience, they're good things, until you realize that there are times when following the dictates of your conscience means standing against democratically made decisions. Let me give you a silly example before a more serious one. A group of four people take a vote to decide what color to paint a wall. Three people vote for blue. The person who gets outvoted sneaks in and paints the wall yellow. Humorous, right? until you realize that actually that's how some of the art objects in this church found their place on the wall. (laughs) That person is, is acting according to her conscience at the same time she's acting in opposition to a democratic process. And of course, there are more serious examples of this. Throughout history, churches have often played a role in offering sanctuary to those who have violated laws or offering sanctuary in violation of laws. This past week, for example, PBS aired a documentary directed by Ken Burns about a Unitarian couple, Waitstill and Martha Sharp, who helped to smuggle Jews and other enemies of the Nazis out of Nazi-controlled Europe. That's conscience over law. And here in the United States, churches have provided sanctuary, sanctuary, to conscientious objectors and draft resistors and immigrant families due to be deported. In fact, in the men's room, just off the sanctuary, uh, there is a shower head in one of the stalls, and I'm told that this was installed for us to be able to provide sanctuary to, as a church to someone should the need arise, to harbor someone who was resisting the law. So there's some tension in that principle, right? Does this make sense that there can be a tension between the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process? I like to joke that that fifth principle can be rewritten. Majority rules, majority doesn't rule. That clears it all up, right? This morning, though, I want to talk about another area of tension contained in those seven principles and and contained in our church. And this is a tension found within the third principle, which calls on us to affirm and promote acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. Acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth. Can anyone comprehend how there might be a little tension there? 
Does that make sense? I often think this principle, jokingly, can be rewritten. We love you exactly the way you are. We want you to change. <laughs> Rachel Rose and I are currently teaching the latest installment of the Exploring Membership class with some of the folks who will be uh, standing up here a couple months' time when we do a welcoming of new members again. In the first session of this class, we do an exercise where we ask the members of the class to draw with, with crayons or with markers to draw their spiritual journeys and then share, share the drawings with the class. This is my favorite part of teaching the class. And one of the stories that we hear in many forms, but over, we hear over and over again, is the role that a lack of acceptance, a lack of acceptance played in people's decisions to leave the religious community they used to be a part of. That can be a lack of acceptance of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people, or a lack of acceptance of an atheist parent or a Jewish husband or a Buddhist daughter. Or it could be a lack of acceptance of sincere questioning of religious questions. Now, please don't think that every person, please don't think I'm saying that every person who comes to our church had a bad experience in their previous religion. That's not the case. Many also talk in the class about the blessings and the benefits of their religious past. But what we hear from people over and over again, what we hear from people who come here is that they are drawn to us by acceptance. Here, gay is okay and doubts are cool, and there's also that broader sense of acceptance, of acceptance of, of teenagers with purple hair and seniors with purple hair. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. And of, of people who, who in many, many contexts in their life feel like they don't quite fit in. And this all is true. This acceptance is real. It is real and it is legitimate. Be who you are. It's real, but it's not the whole story. There is also the other. There's also the encouragement to spiritual growth. Be who you are. Be transformed. This morning, the choir sang that piece inspired by those words we say each week, originally set to music by Eric Bannon turned into a choral piece by Glenn. Those words, whoever you are, whomever you love, however you arrived at this beloved place, you are welcome here. And that's true. And there's also the other. Whoever you are becoming, whomever your ever-expanding heart is learning to love, wherever you are going and however you're growing, you're encouraged here. When I talk about this tension between acceptance and encouragement to spiritual growth, I'm perhaps making too much of a big deal out of this tension and downplaying the degree to which they're both compatible. After all, a safe, accepting environment is surely a better climate for inspiring change and growth than an environment that is hostile and harsh. This is especially true since the transformation that we're about, part of the transformation that we're about as a church, requires a nurturing environment and a climate that encourages vulnerability and risk-taking. So what is this transformation? What is the transformation that occurs in this church community? How are folks transformed here? One of the ways in which I see folks transformed is with the opportunities that they're given for leadership. It starts early. It starts with our, with our youth when they learn to be leaders in the church opportunities for leadership, whether that's being a worship associate or leading a committee or leading a social justice group out in the community. There's the transformation that happens through creativity. I know that uh, a whole group of our new members who joined the church in the past couple of years have formed a, a bluegrass band together. There's also a group of people who've been here for 20 years who have a bluegrass band together, and there is an annual um, an annual play or musical, and there's the choir. And I think that that encouraging of creativity changes us through art and dance and drama. The transformation comes with opportunities for service. People know that when they go out and, and feed people in the community or when they go out and they march with Moral Mondays or when they go out and build 
a Habitat for Humanity house, that, that something within them changes through that service. But mostly, but mostly the transformation that happens here, I believe, happens through opportunities for connection. Opportunities for connection. There's a story that stays with me um, way back, from way back from the church that I did my internship more than, a, more than a decade and a half ago. I did my internship at a church in suburban Dallas, Texas, um, where the Unitarian church there was, was very much an oasis for the people who came. And I remember a member of my internship committee told me the story of how, of how she came. Her name was Jana, and she grew up a very conservative Southern Baptist and went off to college and, and married a Jewish man, Baptist and Jewish, and they sought together a congregation where they could both be. And they decided to try out the Unitarian Church, only they did not try it out on a Sunday morning. Their first time there was on a Friday night when that congregation's pagan circle hosted a bonfire and a chanting, dancing, a chanting, dancing circle dance around the bonfire. <laughs> and she says, she talks about this, and she talks about she was not comfortable with this, <laughs> that she was rethinking everything that she had learned. And something happened, some kind of spirit moved within her as she looked out at these people and saw the sheer joyfulness. She was moved not by the content of the chants, but more moved by the sheer joyfulness of the community together. And she had this kind of breaking through and she decided, I want to be, I want to be with that joy. I want to be in the presence of that joy. And the spirit moved and she joined and joined the church and became a leader of the church. That's transformation, that inbreaking, that inbreaking, whether it is of conscience or of joy or of leadership or of service or of creativity or of art. And I'd also like to say that, that this transformation doesn't just live within our own private hearts that actually the transformation here extends out beyond this little plot of land tucked back from the UNC campus. One of the ways in which it expands is a way that we often don't think about. We often think about the Sunday morning worship service as being a service for us. We often think about religious education for our children as being religious education for our own. We often think about the, our whole lives, sexuality education program as being for our youth. But in fact, this is not entirely true, and there's a different way to see it. And the different way to see it is that the worship, the fact of worship service every Sunday morning is, in fact, more than just for us, that it is a service that we provide to the community, that worship in the liberal religious tradition is actually a service that we provide to the community. I remember, as, and there's moments of alchemy. There's moments of alchemy. I remember it was about a year and a half ago, and I was preaching a sermon on, on mental health and spirituality. And visiting that Sunday morning, dropping in, was a mom who had spent the night in the emergency room at UNC accompanying her, uh, her teen, who was there to uh, be admitted in to the mental health unit. It's a service to the community, that actually the fact of this church is a service to the community. And it's the same way with religious education for, for children and for, and for adults, that that, that that learning and growing that happens there, whether it's a growing to, uh, to do justice, whether it's a growing to accept other faiths, whether it's a growing to be uh, good, wise ambassadors in a multi-religious world, 
That is a service to the community. Our whole lives is a public health service. Our whole lives is a public health service. We change the world in other ways. I moved thinking of the community in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the Unitarian Church there has played an important role in helping that community to process and to face the, the horrors that followed, the horrors of the, of the police shooting there this week. I think of Unitarian Universalists, some even members of, this own, of our own congregation, who went to Charlotte, who went to Charlotte to be um, an ally and a witness and out there in the streets as the folks in Charlotte demonstrated. You look at any picture on the news and there is the standing on the side of love yellow. There's people I know out there. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. We know in our own hearts the transformation that happens here. So may it be.